Bruchem Aboim. The lecture tonight will deal with a uh, topic that I guess we all are participate in, sin. And uh, Webster defines sin as an offense against religious institution, God, or moral law. In Judaism, it's a little more difficult, and there are different categories, and it really break it down into a much finer understanding. The three basic categories are what we call avon, pesha, and chait. And they translate into avon is iniquity, a pesha is a transgression, and a chait is a sin. So how are they different? So iniquity and avon is when one is corrupted by his intellect with inspired thoughts of apostasy and the heresy. He denies the one who commands or denies that he is commanded regarding a certain matter. Pesha, a person who transgresses when someone rebels against his master, he recognizes his master and he deliberately removes his yoke from him. And chait, when it comes to sin, is when a desire forces him to the point where he feels compelled by his Yetzirah's evil inclination and desire to go against the will of his creator. So these are three basic, one of the kindnesses of God, and we'll talk about in future lectures, hopefully about uh, punishment and guilt, um, that God in his benevolence will try to judge a person in the lesser category of hate rather than in the categories of avon or pesha, of iniquity or transgression. In addition, sins are broken up into three more categories, what we call mazid, shogig, and ones. A mazid is an intentional sin. There's, you know that it's, it's forbidden to do something. You want to have some pork ribs. You know they're forbidden. Your smells too much. You just really enjoy eating them. You eat them, you know that you shouldn't. That's amazing. You've done something intentionally, you know it's forbidden, you've done it anyways. Shogeg is maybe you come home and you see some food on the table and um, you might have a non-Jewish maid and she's brought some food in and you see it on the table and even though you should have checked, you decided that it's probably okay. And meanwhile, it wasn't kosher. And an ones would be if you yawn and you hit a light switch. Or someone pushes you and you turn on a light on Shabbos. That would be an ones. So you have an intentional sin, an unintentional sin, and one that is a complete accident without you planning to do so. And what's interesting is in the time of the temple, if a person sinned, had a chait, a knowing sin, he would bring a sacrifice. Now, logically, if you were to ask someone out of the three categories of mazed, intentional, shogig, accidental, not thinking, and one something that was inadvertent, you couldn't stop, which one would you bring a sacrifice for? So I think logic would dictate you do it for an intentional sin. You knew something was wrong, you did it. And therefore, you bring a sacrifice. After all, a sacrifice would be an animal, which would be an expense. So one would think that would be the reason to bring it. The answer is no. If a person sins intentionally, he knows he's a sinner. And his job becomes to do what we call tshuva, to repent. And we'll talk about that in a later lecture. So what does he bring the sacrifice for? A shogeg. Something that he did where he would say, I just wasn't thinking. And that's why I did it. And that is the reason why he brings the sacrifice. Because just by its very nature, when we say that I wasn't thinking, that's already kind of a cop-out of a sin. I wasn't thinking. So if I wasn't thinking, therefore, I should be, the sin should not be so grievous. And what the Torah tells us is, that's really not a, a, an excuse because a person should be thinking. A person should be awake at the wheel. That if you go to sleep 
and you fall asleep at the wheel, then the end result becomes you can have an accident. And what the Torah requires of us, demands of us, is that we always stay in the game. A person is where his thoughts are. And if you're not focused on what's happening, then that becomes something that's grievous and can lead to many problems. So when a person has to bring that sacrifice for this sin of not thinking, all of a sudden maybe he starts to think a little more and maybe he stays focused a little bit better because of the amount of financial loss and difficulty that dealing with this sacrifice and also having to kill an animal because of what he did. All of these things come to play. Now, what is really, what's the origin of sin? After all, wh why do we sin? After God, somehow, some way, this is, is part of God's master plan, part of this computer program that God has made for this world that we live in. And the fact that the Torah tells us that man was, con was created, Ra Min Arav, evil from birth, means that God somehow, some way, has set the deck against us. In fact, we say in one of the blessings after we have anything but bread or cake, that God created us, all of us, with deficiencies. So if you will, God has put us into this world, every one of us, with challenges. All of us are addicts. All of us want something that may not be proper. We have a desire for something. And our job in life is to work against that negativity, that challenge that we have, that personality trait, and become better by doing so. In fact, we see when God offered the Torah, according to the Medrash, to the world, it's, it's, we look, it's strange, but he offered it to the Gentile nations first. And he started with the 6th, 7th, 8th, commandment, not the first, I am the Lord your God, but you shouldn't kill. He went to the children of Asab and told them, they asked him what's in the Torah, and he, God said, you can't kill, and they said, we live by the sword. That's our nature. We can't accept it. And to Yishmael, they asked what's in it, and God said, you can't steal, and they said, that's how we make our living, we steal. To the sons of, of Moab and Ammon, sexual impropriety, and they say we were born from illicit relations. And when God offered the Torah to the Jews, it's interesting, they said, Nasev and Nishma, we will do and we will listen. So how is that the same? And the answer is that the trait of a Jew is to always be one that has, is a stiff-necked people, a person who's contentious, a person who questions everything. And by virtue of questioning everything, when they accepted the Torah, it was sight unseen, just because God asked them to. They didn't ask any questions. They went against their nature. So life is, in all facets of life, everything in life is, is tested to its weakest point. Everything in sports, everything in science, everything in the world, every relationship. If you play tennis, you play doubles, everything is, all the, all the, the whole game goes to the weakest player. That's where everybody plays against. I have, used to ski with a group of people. The person who was the weakest skier never stopped because everybody waited till he got there and then everybody took off again. He was constantly skiing and just got slower and slower. Everything goes to its weakest point. What's, again, the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So what God gives us in this world, he has us sin so that we have something to work on. But why? And the answer is that God can give us the final reward, which we call Olam Haba, the world to come. He can give it to us as a poor man. He can give it to us as a handout. But he says, you know what, my children, I love you so much, I'll give you a chance to earn it. And I'm going to give you certain tests that you have to pass in order to get there. Because if God wants perfection, he doesn't need us at all. Angels are perfect. He already has perfection. But God enjoys us more than he does angels, an imperfect person serving him, even with imperfection, just making that effort to be better, to avoid sin. And then, as it says, Shevet Pitzvot Tzadik will come, 
that a tzaddik falls seven times but he gets up. And what's interesting is that a Baal Tshuva, one who is a repentant, one who has sinned, and then has tried to correct that sin, according to our commentaries, is greater than a righteous person. Because he's overcome, or he's attempting to overcome his weaknesses. In fact, we see that Moshe Rabbeinu at the end of his life is called Ish Anamao, the humblest of all men. Why that? Torah compliments him about nothing other than that. Because Moshe Bino's test in life was arrogance. He was born in the palace of Paro, or brought up in the palace of Paro, as a prince. According to the Medrash, was the king of Ethiopia for 40 years, and then the king of the Jewish nation. He was always in an elevated position. He was always a hedge taller, not just physically, but in all regards of everyone around him, which gives a person ego. And yet he was able to overcome that and become the humblest of all men, take his weakness and make it a strength. And that's our job. Our job is that though we may sin, we need to be, take that as a test. And where does sinning again come from? Again, we know the Torah gave us the Ten, ten Commandments, which is really not Ten Commandments. In Hebrew, it's the Ten Sayings. Five on one tablet and five on the other. Five that deal with God, the first five. And then the other side, the other five that deal with man. And the question becomes, is it worse to sin against God or worse to sin against man? And again, logic would dictate, I would think it's worse to sin against God. And in reality, it's actually worse to sin against man. Because when you sin against man, you also sin against God. So it becomes a double sin against man and then against God. And the sad part about this also is, when you sin against God, he's your father. And he can forgive you with, with great ease. Whereas a person finds it difficult to do so. So even being forgiven, and even though we, again, will deal with forgiveness, it's much easier for it to happen to God, not with a person. So which is worse? If we, we have a positive, we have 365 negative commandments, 248 positive commandments. So which is worse, to sin against God and against a positive or a negative? And one would think that if you go against what God has told us not to do, but you do it, that would be worse than sinning when God says do something, but you didn't do it. Omission. And the answer is no. Because if you've omitted doing something, you haven't created even a negative force. You've created nothing. Because you did nothing. If you sin against God in a negative way, what you've done is you've gone against what God has said, but you did an action. You brought something into the world. Something exists. And now you have the ability to reach back. Something that's not part of this world, but it is in heaven. You're able to reach back and take that negative act and take that sin and turn it into a mitzvah, into a good deed by correcting what you did. If you do it, with proper repentance out of love. It's an amazing phenomenon. To be able to take the negative and turn it into a positive. It's called tshuva miyava. It's repentance out of love. But in the end, what is a sin? There are big mitzvahs that we have and small. In fact, God kind of throws a curve when he gives us the same reward for sending away the mother bird and not taking the bird and the egg at the same time. And honoring parents. Both... The reward is long life. And then we see again, and even in punishments, some things, there are death penalties, some things there's malchus, lashes. So there are different levels. But in reality, we need to know there's really only one level of sin. If a king tells you to stand and protect him, give your life up for him, and you don't, you will be put to death. You went against the order of the king. What if the king tells you to move over one seat and you say no? You're put to death because you went against the will of the king. So in reality, every sin that we do, there is no such thing as a big sin or a small sin. Every sin that we do is going against the will of the creator, of God Almighty. So every sin has with it the punishment, so to speak, of a death penalty going against the will of the king. Hopefully next week what we'll do is continue with this idea and deal with punishment and reward and also deal with guilt and regret.
God bless. Thank you for coming. Have a great Shabbos.